So welcome everyone on this fine Friday afternoon. Thank you, especially to our speaker, Earl, who is here on the East Coast. So this is 5 p.m. on a Friday for him. It is well into have a cup of tea or a cocktail or do whatever hour, uh, but he has chosen to spend it with us. Um, he will also be, he was meant to be here today. Um, so we are gonna have him come for a visit, uh, hopefully later in winter quarter or possibly in spring quarter. So um, please, you know, let me know as we get closer to that, we'll announce that. You can do some one-on-one -on -one meetings, small groups, things like that um, with him. Hopefully you'll be super inspired by today's talk. I know I always am when I get a chance to, to talk with Earl. Um, so yes, Earl Huff is a fourth year PhD student. He's in human-centered computing at the School of Computing at Clemson. Um, one of the things I love about Earl is that he's got two very distinct threads of research and somehow manages to balance those. So he does uh, a lot of in-vehicle experience work, but also a bunch of accessibility work. So, um, you know, super cool, interesting, diverse sets of things um, and really thinking about what are the barriers that limit or potentially exclude participation of people from marginalized and underserved populations? And how can we use uh, you know, our advances in science and technology to address those kinds of disparities? So I'm super thrilled. Um, I'll also tell you all that uh, Earl is on the job market this year. So you know, tell the folks you know who are hiring that he's fantastic. Um, and we'll get to hear a bit today about the excellent work that he's been doing. So thank you so much. Welcome to Earl Huff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for everyone for attending. About to start this show. And I have share screen um, abilities, correct? Uh, if, if, is it working for you otherwise? You look to be a co-host, so I'm guessing yes. Oh, nice. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, okay. and while he's doing the share screen, I should have mentioned, um, sometimes it's hard for them, for people who are speaking to monitor the chat, uh, but we, but Daniel and I will try to watch the chat as well. Um, so, you know, jump in with your questions anytime, anywhere, um, and then we'll, you know, make sure that, that he gets them at the end, if not before. Excellent. Um, are there going to be subtitles or transcription involved uh, the year? I can provide subtitles. Yes, there's there's a, a live transcript that's that's running. Perfect. Great. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Excellent. Okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk again. I am Earl Hub Jr., PhD candidate on the Human Centered Computing Program at Clemson University. And so I'm going to talk about uh, research um, that I entitled. To understand a problem, you must understand the people, a human-centered approach towards creating an inclusive and equitable society. So to begin, I want to highlight some uh, examples of technology that we have today that may be accessible um, and or inequitable for certain users. So the first image I want to provide is a touchscreen interface. So it's an image of a person actually touching the screen we see them all about, so we have it on our smartphones. We go to self-checkout registers to hit touch screens. Certain vehicles may have in-vehicle infotainment displays. However, depending on the device, the size of it, these touch screens uh, may be inaccessible for people who use certain technologies such as screen readers, even those who have certain mobility impairments as well. So in some instances, these touch screens are not uh, fully accessible for all users. So image number two on the top right um, is a powered wheelchair. So this particular one is interesting because it allows you to climb stairs. So it's a great mobility aid for those with motor impairments, but it also costs 40,000 US dollars. So you're pretty much paying a whole car to get this wheelchair. So in some ways, this tech can be seen as inaccessible by cost for people with motor impairments, also for those from low income households as well. The last example I'll point to on the bottom right, uh, images of four faces uh, with some images, some description about them. This comes from a software called Compass, used in courtrooms by judges when reviewing um, pro cases by, for offenders. So Compass determines a numerical value to indicate the recidivism rate or the rate in which the likelihood uh, someone may reoffend. So if one meaning low risk, 10 meaning high risk. At times it is shown that Compass would compute low risk numbers for white offenders with felony crimes while computing high risk 
for, for Black offenders with misdemeanor crimes. So these findings have shown a pattern of racial bias by the AI likely due to racially biased data. And so we need to ask ourselves the question, well, why, why do we have such exclusive and inaccessible technology? Well, the government research has shown there are three particular reasons why we may see such exclusive technology. Uh, the first being, oh, there we go. So the first being technology is not designed for with input from all users. So some technology do not have the input of every possible user. Therefore, it's a highly likelihood that um, their needs are not going to be met as a result. And it kind of pours into the second reason I have shown the screen as well as developers, especially in years past, that would develop technology first and then evaluate the technology second, which goes with have shown that um, the technology does not work very well because they don't get their input um, first, which should technically be the uh, focus, especially now with companies hiring more UX researchers to help in this matter. And I want to point to now the third reason, and probably one of our prevalent reasons actually is uh, that most development teams are, lack diversity in terms of demographic background. So think of race, ethnicity, gender, ability, sex, and the list goes on. And the research has shown that um, having these diverse teams lead to better products and services because of the diversity of the voices as well as the perspectives. Uh, even prominent figures have talked to the necessity of diversity within development teams. So the example of Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook once mentioned, you know, we are building products that people with very diverse backgrounds use. And I think we all want our company makeup to reflect the makeup of other people who use our products. And another quote um, to go into, if you're going to build a product for everyone, you need to have a team that represents everyone. And this kind of leads to what I do for my research as I will discuss um, for this talk. And so my agenda, I'll talk on two phases. One, my work in designing inclusive and accessible technology, particularly in transportation, as well as education. And then the second part, I will talk about my research in broadening participation in computing. So let's jump right into the first aspect and I'll talk more about transportation, particularly focus on autonomous vehicles. And so autonomous vehicles, first emerging transportation technology that can reshape the landscape in personal mobility. Uh, these autonomous vehicles can enable passengers to go anywhere with minimal input in the driving task. Um, the benefits to them includes reducing road accidents, saving lives, and reduce healthcare costs. Uh, but there is some concerns. So while autonomous vehicles are great and they sound awesome on paper, we need to ask ourselves, well, are they designed for all? Um, there are concerns around the design of autonomous vehicles for people with disabilities. Um, do they uh, benefit, can they benefit people, let's say older adults or even people with visual impairments? Um, the National Federation of the Blind has uh, come out saying that these vehicles are being designed for drivers of the present, meaning people with more full sight, uh, full mobile capabilities. And so this can be a problem for um, those with disabilities who may want to use this emerging technology. And so I've done a series of investigations that I'll talk briefly about um, three studies focused on particularly older adults and people with disabilities, as well as um, future consumers in the regards to transparency of autonomous vehicles. And so I'll touch on the first study, um, focus groups of older adults, so I have an image of um, older adults, um, five of them at a table working on uh, a design kit. So the focus of this uh, focus group interview was to gather information about participants, prior knowledge of autonomous vehicles, um, who they believe can actually own an autonomous vehicle and actually operate them, and their own personal opinions regarding um, operating an autonomous vehicle. And so seven focus group interviews were conducted with 39 participants, all African-American, um, average age around 74. And so they did kind of an ideation kit to, to determine um, who they feel are likely people to own and operate a vehicle, the kind of house and income they may have, and what the vehicle will look like, which I'll get into shortly. And so the findings from that focus group produce several themes. Um, so subject vehicle concerns, cost, purchase considerations, including costs, risk and trust factors, some of the legality concerns. Um, interactions with uh, 
non-self-driving vehicles or pedestrians, uh, the design of self-driving vehicles if they would support older adults, and some of the potential benefits of self-driving vehicles. And so the main takeaways from this study was that while participants found self-driving vehicles to be beneficial in terms of improving their personal mobility and their independence, they did not feel comfortable with the idea of vehicle because they didn't like the idea of losing control, especially for those that still drive and didn't necessarily want to um, lose that ability or have it taken away from them. Also, trust factors, um, they're concerned about reliability, would it break down, or even when it interact with pedestrians or non-autonomous vehicles. So how would it work with a vehicle that's perhaps tailing uh, a driver and then needs to get around them? Would it detect it? Would, um, would it be able to maneuver quickly enough or even at issues of a yellow light and would the car try to beat it before it hit red? Just some examples. Also, cost was another concern. They felt these vehicles would be too expensive. So when asked about pricing, a lot of them said upwards of 60,000 to even 100K. So we're talking about luxury vehicle range if we're putting perspective on this. Um, and then participants did not feel that uh, the vehicles were being developed with them in mind, particularly um, with cost. Now, particularly because they're all they were all African-American, and so we theorized part of that could be um, the historical disparities in wealth between Black and white um, um, persons. And then from the ideation kit, a lot of them had shows even uh, Asian faces as um, people who are most likely to own these vehicles, associating them with uh, being tech savvy, wealth, um, the vehicle being more expensive in that regards. So we wanted to look more into how we can design um, autonomous vehicles, particularly to support their needs. And so we took a different direction. And so we wanted to explore what the interior of autonomous vehicle would look like and what are some design considerations. And so we utilize what's called user enactment. And so it's essentially taking role play and using it for interaction design. It's ideal for exploring the use of technology that's not currently available without requiring any high fidelity instruments, and thus in this case. So we basically use um, blue tape. We had six chairs arranged in a way that looked like an SUV. So we created uh, this concept of a mid-sized crossover SUV with about 90, 190 inches in length, 75 inches in width, with three rows of two seats. And so we did this with 30 participants over seven days where uh, we had different scenarios of people entering the vehicle, what was going on on route to their destinations and exiting the vehicle as well. And so I'll provide some images of kind of the evolution of this uh, autonomous vehicle, particularly in the context of a, a shared vehicle in this concept. So the first image, um, we did this at a center serving older adults. And so we had the six chairs, the blue tape, and we had some uh, cardboard to represent the front and the back of the vehicle. So this was the original design that we had based on um, our prior research and a pilot study we did. But over time, there were some changes in the development of the autonomous vehicle. So one of which the seating arrangement changed with two seats in the front, three seats in the back. Um, it eventually changed back because people liked the um, two row, um, the three row, two seat setup. And some additional um, things you may know is some cardboard on the bottom representing some props. So we introduced some props for this role play. Um, represents different things that they may have wanted added that we perhaps didn't have immediately available. And so the number of these uh, props started to increase as you notice from the pictures on the bottom left and the bottom right. Uh, and I'll explain these in the next slide, particularly what these um, props represented. So the findings show from design choice, the six seat configuration and the design were more preferable. Um, some of the desired features included some swivel chairs to make it easier to get in and out of the vehicle, uh, lift, a lift system, so basically, um, adjustable air suspension so the vehicle can lower down to make it easier for ingress and egress, uh, mobility aid storage and some helper handles. And then looking at 
um, the interaction with the passengers uh, with the vehicle, particularly multimodal interaction. So voice was definitely something that was expressed, um, being able to use the um, smartphone. So smartphone integration that was also um, brought up a lot in the discussion. So being able to connect maybe with some applications with the vehicle um, and being able to be dropped off at a location closer to the entrance as well. When talking about um, concerns with the autonomous vehicle, um, privacy of communication. So there was concern about if the vehicle would be listening. So as they may engage with other passengers or just talking on the phone, they felt that would the vehicle actually pick up on what I'm saying and was it, would it store that information? So there were some privacy concerns uh, with the autonomous vehicle. And then also the aspect of no human operator, no like no pedals, no steering wheels. They were concerned about um, any situation that involved emergency takeover if needed be, if the system perhaps failed. Um, and also for design considerations, it was pretty much unanimous that they want auto manufacturers to think about including their input in the design of these autonomous vehicles um, and their input of people with disabilities as well. And so we wanted to look a little bit more into the privacy aspect that was brought up from that study. And that then we pivot over to transparency of autonomous vehicles. So a bit of a background of, of glasses and looking into the forest, just as a, an example. And so this came from the idea of being aware of the vehicle's operation. Um, it was brought up in the previous two studies that um, people were concerned about what the vehicle is doing. And if it made a decision, um, would it let the passengers know of the decisions? And so um, there was a huge gap in kind of understanding the transparency and how it affects on consumers' desire to have an autonomous vehicle. And so a survey study was conducted to gain consumer perceptions of autonomous vehicles' capabilities in terms of sharing information and communicating with passengers. So the survey was developed using existing instruments um, that talked about um, trust and transparency in organizations and trust in automation. And so when you talk about transparency, um, the definition that was used in the literature is uh, a deliberate attempt for making all information um, available in a manner that's accurate, timely, balanced, and unequivocal. So when we translate it within the context of an autonomous vehicle, um, the definition was more of communication of operational status, understanding the environment, and communication of its decision making. And so this is based on four dimensions that was um, this, that was brought in from the trust and transparency and organizations um, instrument, accountability, um, the effort of the AV to communicate with the passenger, sharing information and concerns of information hiding of the autonomous vehicle. And so we garnered respondents from 996 um, consumers. Uh, most of us was mostly uh, male, um, average age is around close to 35 and a wider range of different income. Uh, we did get a little under 11% uh, who identified as having a disability. And so we looked at it as the individual, um, the independent variables of age. So we broke it up in age group um, by young adult, middle age and older adult, and as well as income. And then the dependent variables was responses across the four dimensions. Now, this was a larger survey. There were more questions involved and more demographics, but we focused particularly on just age and income for the time being. So I'll talk about the findings based on that analysis. And so summary of the findings showed that with middle-aged and older adults, um, they're actually more optimistic regarding uh, how autonomous vehicle could be accountable or communicate and share information. This kind of goes in opposite of the literature which showed that older adults were more skeptical. Um, they were more concerned about autonomous vehicle and insurance information. So this was actually um, new. Whereas young adults were more concerned about information hiding behaviors when the literature actually showed that's more older adults having that kind of concern. Looking at the income perspective, um, in line with existing literature that people of high income, in this case above 55K, were more optimistic. And uh, they were less concerned about information hiding behaviors of an autonomous vehicle, which shows that um, people of higher income 
are more willing to accept, adopt, buy, and operate these autonomous vehicles. Um, and so that ends the research arm into transportation. I now want to pivot into uh, my current research into um, uh, computer science education. Sorry, it's getting kind of dark here, so let me turn on some light in my room. There we go, perfect. All right, so the motivation focuses on um, the lack of representation and lack of participation of people with disabilities in computer science. Um, particularly some early attempts in broadening participation of underrepresented groups started with um, curriculum such as exploring computer science and AP computer science principles uh, course, which measures have shown students can have the number of underrepresented groups taking CS courses in K-12 schools. However, uh, that was primarily a focus of racial and ethnic groups, but there's still a gross lack of participation of people with disabilities in computer science. In the K-12 level, only 8% of the students who are served under the IDEA Act have actually taken a CS course. Looking specifically at blind or visually impaired persons, such as the info of the image, a woman sitting on a stool holding a uh, guide cane wearing uh, shades, um, particularly under 3% of undergraduate and graduate degree uh, recipients in computing and mathematics were actually um, people with visual impairments. And so the research points to uh, many learning and technological barriers that impact their um, progression in CS courses. So this may in turn make them more independent learners finding alternative resources or just giving up and pursuing CS altogether. And so I was very interested in exploring more about the state of accessibility and CS education, uh, wanted to know more about accessibility from the perspective of the teachers and students, uh, some of the strategies that teachers use in providing more accessible materials to their students, and some of the areas within CS that learners do well in, as well as perhaps struggle in. And so I have some overarching research questions for um, my research, particularly aspects within uh, K-12 CS education presenting challenges to persons with vis visual impairments, strategies used by teachers and current resources that exist um, for persons with visual impairments to learn CS um, in the K-12 level. And so to explore this, I conducted three exploratory studies investigating the state of accessibility from three different perspectives. So interviewing professional developers with visual impairments, um, interviewing K-12 teachers um, who teach visually impaired students in CS, and then a remote observation of a computer science course um, at the K-12 level. Um, so I won't go in terribly um, in depth about these studies. Um, they are published, but I will talk about the key findings uh, from them. So the findings from my exploration aligns with existing research and that much of CS curricula in K-12 is inaccessible in terms of learning materials. Um, teachers often have to modify what exists to meet the needs of the students, and it actually differs between students who are blind and students with low vision. Learning tools such as code editors or integrated development environments, which are basically a platform with editors and other um, tools necessary to do um, code developments, they're too complex and not very accessible for screen reader devices that read um, visual displays. So students often are resorting to simpler editors, um, such as Notepad++, or even using Microsoft Word or Google Docs for that matter. An interesting pattern in the findings is actually perceived advantages of um, being blind or visually impaired. Some advantages that were mentioned, including greater focus and attention to detail, the ability to develop a better mental model of the code base and memorization, and much of this helps them to perform certain tasks better than sighted programmers, such as uh, spotting code errors. And then the biggest finding from all this is um, online learning and use of electronic materials. Uh, many teachers use curriculum and tools from places such as code.org and CodeHS, as some of their web-based materials and tools are a little more accessible for the students. Um, online learning does have a number of advantages, including things like the asynchronous nature of learning, uh, removing the need to meet in person for classes, and again, more of the web-based resources are accessible for the most part. But there are also some disadvantages, especially for people with visual impairments, as it requires level of proficiency with using a computer and also assistive technologies. Plus, 
there are some unknown accessibility of certain um, online learning platforms for that regards. And that's where my dissertation research actually comes into play. Um, so particularly, um, my dissertation focused on design and interaction elements that are necessary to make online learning platforms accessible for um, blind and vision impaired learners. My work contributes to the field of accessible computing and computing education by utilizing user-centered design to design and develop a learning platform in order to explore what um, an accessible online learning experience would be like for K-12 students in CS as well as teachers. And as part of my work, I solicit the uh, input of K-16 students with visual impairments and K-12 teachers to inform the design of this platform. And so briefly to touch on um, user-centered design, it's an iterative design process using HCI for including end users and stakeholders in all phases of the process. Generally, there are four phases. Phase one is gathering data about um, the users, how to use the technology and in what context um, is that uh, technology being used. Using that to then create um, user requirements for design and technology, which then becomes a series of design solutions that then become prototypes that are then evaluated in phase four. So results of that evaluation can lead to meeting all the user's requirements or reiterating on the design based on the feedback received. And so as part of my dissertation research, I've conducted three studies um, to look at different aspects for designing um, usable and accessible online learning experiences. So first I'll talk about is the survey of online for readiness for online learning. And so the goal was to explore perceptions of readiness for um, online learning between sighted and visually impaired students. And so I had seven research questions. Um, the first four, I talked about perceptions of the importance and their confidence in certain competencies for online learning, which I will discuss in the next couple of slides um, from the perspective of all students, sighted students and visually impaired students. Uh, the next three set of questions focus more on perceived advantages and disadvantages of online learning and challenges that are specific to vis visually impaired students. And so the study um, utilized an online survey measuring importance and confidence in online learning competencies. Uh, I use an instrument uh, known as the Student Readiness for Online Learning Questionnaire. It measures four competencies tied to a person's readiness for learning online environments. Um, such competencies include student attributes, so like their own personal attributes for uh, taking online courses, time management skills, using communication technologies to talk with students as well as the teacher, and help seeking, and then technical competence, so being able to use um, online educational technologies such as learning management systems, as well as uh, like online gradebooks, for example. And so each uh, competency contains five statements rated on a liquor scale of one to five, um, the respondents answer all the questions twice. So once for rating perceived importance and once for perceived confidence. I've also included a number of open-ended questions to ask students about perceived advantages, disadvantages, and challenges to online learning. And so participants were undergraduate and graduate students who have taken at least one fully online course. In total, 196 responses were gathered, 72 of which um, where people identified as blind or visually impaired, who uses assistive technologies such as screen readers, uh, magnification, and braille display. The average age was around 24 years of age. Most of the students were undergraduate. Um, graduate students um, included master students, doctoral students, students pers uh, pursuing a graduate certificate, and post baccalaureate. Uh, on average, these students took uh, six online courses. And so I'll talk about pretty much summarizing the findings from the study. Particularly, I looked at um, perceptions of students overall, um, perception of just sighted students, and perceptions of the, of the visually impaired students. And so the findings um, show created higher confidence in their technical competency uh, for online learning over their own attributes, time management, and communication. However, blind or visually impaired students uh, were indifferent in their perceived importance of and confidence in the online learning competencies. Um, so this would suggest possibly that there were factors 
um, not included in the survey that may impact um, how they feel um, they may fare in taking online courses. That's what I theorized from the results. When looking at um, notable advantages of online learning, the most common responses uh, included uh, convenience, flexibility of schedule, including for those that have families or work full time, um, and the ability to work from the comfort of home as well. And in some cases, learning at their own pace. But there were some notable disadvantages in online learning, including the lack of social interaction. So it was difficult for students to interact with other students online and seek help from teachers as well. They felt like teachers were not as available online as they were in person when they could just raise their hand and be like, I have a question in that regards. Um, also lack of focus and concentration because being at home, they may have faced a number of distractions at home as well, especially for those that have family um, or kids, for example. Um, and looking at challenges of blind and vision impaired students, most notably inaccessible course materials. Many of them had discussed materials that were used in person, which is basically translated to online and without any consideration for making them accessible. Um, and also being difficult to reach out to the teachers for help as well. There was feelings of isolation as well. So they feel like because they weren't able to connect with their peers in class and connect with the teacher, they felt isolated and uh, felt like they had to be more independent learners. And it fed into um, their perception of the widening learning gap between them and their peers as well. And so taking this information, um, I used it to fuel the second study of my dissertation uh, where I focused on actually designing an, an online learning management system uh, with storytelling, which I'll go into shortly. So the goals of this study was to use participatory design um, to gather input from important stakeholders on how a learning platform should be designed. Um, also to learn more about prior experiences with using existing learning platforms. And so the findings from the study would help to answer some research questions I had about design requirements necessary for uh, making the platform usable and accessible from the perspective of both the learners as well as the teachers. And so participatory design um, HI for um, basically your end users become co-designers, viewers experts as it relates to their experiences, um, their needs, understanding what the product needs to meet their satisfaction, um, getting them involved in providing uh, suggestions and inputs for a technology or um, a service to be designed. And the literature has shown that participatory design has been used in educational contexts, particularly for designing learning environments using feedback from teachers and students as well. Now, typically in most cases, when using participatory design, researchers will introduce certain stimuli to help frame the context of the product use, um, such as personas as seen on the left is uh, Laura, the persona, uh, and some storyboards, which you see on the right side as well, and some scenarios. However, the challenge is um, when working with blind or vision impaired co-designers, these particular stimuli are not as useful as effective. Um, and so I had to look for an alternative variant that would be more accessible and to get the participants more engaged. And so the research has shown has pointed to storytelling. So example, I have a mother reading to her child, a little cute storybook. Um, <laughs> so storytelling, um, using verbal stories and narratives as an accessible approach, um, especially in works with uh, kids as well but also for um, persons with visual impairments. And so stories in general help participants think about their past experience, which in turn makes them better prepared to provide design input. And so for my study, I used a method called co-constructing stories, uh, which is a combination of participatory design as well as storytelling. And so with co-constructing stories, there are two stories you employ. So the first story introduces the context of use of the technology in question. And it's basically reading that story um, as it relates to participant experiences and asking participants questions that have them think about their past experiences as it relates to what the story was about. The second part is the second story introduced in the product and sort of this incomplete narrative. Um, so there's a main character using this technology, but it's not complete. And it's intentional because part of this process is having to participants 
put themselves as the main character. Think about the, um, the context and think about how the technology will be designed and used. Thus, um, they will be providing input on the design and the functions that are needed as well. And so with this study, um, I conducted a series of design workshops with two groups of co-designers. Group one consisted of two K-12 teachers uh, with experience teaching computer science to blind or vision impaired students. One teacher was sighted, another was blind who used a screen reader. The second group consisted of three blind or vision impaired students, um, all um, either undergraduate or graduate. Two of the students identified as blind and used screen readers and braille display. The third student identified as low vision and used magnification. Um, all together, they've taken a number of uh, online courses as part of their uh, academic career. Um, and so with these groups, I conducted three one-hour design workshops uh, with each group over the span of six weeks. Um, each workshop aimed to understand the experiences of the group members, use their experience to provide design requirements for the platform, with the third workshop being an evaluation of this um, early build prototype. So the first design workshop, I use co-constructing stories as a way to introduce the concept of the platform and to get the groups thinking about their own experiences and how they would imagine a platform for their benefit. The context and concept stories were tailored to each particular group using informed research and data from my previous exploration. Um, so there was two stories for the teachers and then there was two separate stories for the students. And so in the second design workshop, we revisited the second story, that's the concept story, but more in depth for enlisting more concrete design and interaction ideas. So as I was going through the story, we stopped at critical junctures to elaborate further on the different features of the platform and collaboratively discuss um, how it could be designed to be more accessible uh, for users. Um, using an input from those first two sessions, I created an initial prototype of the platform uh, for the groups to evaluate in the final design workshop, engaging in one-on-one -on -one sessions where each user was engaging in kind of a think aloud as they navigated and used some of the features available. So I'll provide a summary of some of the um, desired features and functionality from each perspective. And so from the teacher's perspective, they wanted multimodal output of content to support students, such as a built-in page reader. So they didn't have to rely on um, screen readers to read over the content. Instead, they could just use the built-in page reader to do it for them. As well as the flexibility of how they could create the courses, as well as the course content in terms of the layout and positioning, being able to view what they created in terms of the course content from a student's point of view. So one teacher particularly creates a dummy student account so that they create the course content and then log into the student account so that they can see what it will look like when it's done. They refer to just have that option built in so they don't have to go through that longer process. Um, and definitely the ability to message or you know, communicate with students um, through live chat or synchronous messaging through the platform. On the student's side, the main desire is focused around proper labeling of elements, using semantic HTML elements uh, more often to help screen readers identify certain structures of the page. So students often talked about navigational issues where they come across um, elements that are not appropriate to the structures. So example, um, they don't use the nav elements, uh, which is the HTML element for describing the navigational page and it gets them upset. Uh, usually a lot of div elements are used with IDs um, and so they wanted to see more consistent use of semantic HTML elements in that sense. Uh, and a clean user interface to make navigation easier. Uh, they often talked about particular learning platforms that were a pain to go through because they had to jump through a nest of buttons, menus, just to get to the lecture page. And so taking all that input into consideration, I actually developed um, and coded um, a learning platform, an early prototype. So this is one particular screenshot. Um, if anyone has used uh, Canvas, for example, there are some similarities in how this is structured. So there's a side navigation um, with some common menus, so profile courses for teachers creating the course um, and a code editor, which I'll talk about uh, momentarily, logging out and there's some list of courses that they could uh, traverse to. 
So one of the things that was also brought up was perhaps support for a code editor. And so this platform, I including a simple built-in code editor, particularly for use right now for web development. Um, there are three editor panes, one for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. There's some code in each um, that it can use and then actually preview what the web page will look like on a preview pane at the bottom of those three editors as well. And so uh, the students were able to utilize that code editor and I got their thoughts on that as well. And so kind of providing a summary of the evaluation from the third design workshop, both groups were generally positive with the platform. Both groups like the simplicity and the cleanness of the user interface. Uh, again, talking back to systems that were cluttered with buttons and nested menus, it made for an easier experience navigating to the pages. Students believe the platform was accessible with their assistive technologies. They were able to access the course content with little to no difficulty. Teachers reinforced that as well, saying that it was very straightforward um, to use the controls for managing the course roster, as well as creating lecture content. Some notable areas of improvement were some a little clearer labeling of some of the elements, um, as well as BBC added some alt text to certain images like profile pictures, and the code editor could use some improvements as well. So they liked it, but there were some issues working with their screen readers. Uh, which I believe I've corrected now um, since then. Um, and so that platform has been revised and is currently undergoing evaluation. And speaking of the evaluation, that is actually the third and final study of my dissertation. And so the goal is to assess usability and accessibility of their prototype system uh, with this time visually impaired K-12 students and their teachers. So I'm doing a comparison with high school students, particularly um, cited as well as visually impaired, just to see uh, how the two would um, compare as far as using it, as well as the K-12 teachers. Basically, they're being assigned a number of tasks to complete on each side. Um, and then they evaluate it with a survey that contains some single ease questions that ask about um, the perceived um, ease or difficulty of each task. Then the system usability scale, which is used to assess overall usability of technology. And for the students in particular, they also are going to use uh, the technology acceptance model um, survey. This one in particular was designed for um, assessing use of online educational technology, which is why I included this particular variance to learn more about will they be willing to accept or use this type of platform. And so there were also some post evaluation interviews I will conduct with the teachers and students to gain a better understanding of their experiences using this platform. And so my work will con contribute um, informing educators, instructional designers, and accessibility researchers on how we design better accessible learning experiences for learners with visual impairments, providing some design recommendations uh, for online learning platforms and demonstrating the use of user-centered design to improve accessibility in online education. So now I want to jump back when I talked about some of the reasons for exclusion, uh, I mentioned there were three reasons behind that. Particularly, I wanted to talk about the third reason, the lack of diversity in design development teams. And part of that reason is the lack of representation within uh, the computing workforce. And part of my research additionally is in broadening participation in computing. And so I want to touch a little bit on that with an instance of uh, some of my work in the area, particularly virtual. And so the, this focus on undergraduate um, African-American computer science students with potentially an interest in pursuing um, graduate studies in computer science. And so the motivation was really looking at virtual learning alternatives to supplement the mentoring effort of marginalized groups in CS. Uh, so we looked at conversational user interfaces such as embodied conversational agents, which are software programs that can uh, engage in human dialogue with users Often they may have a graphical representation of an actual human um, and they, can, they have been used in various domains such as in therapy, as an academic advising because of their um, perceived fidelity and credibility of the conversation they have with human users. And so the virtual mentoring, um, we theorize that the benefits would be removing the need to set up a time and place for meetings uh, since the mentor can be easily accessed from uh, a user's device at any time. And existing research has shown that virtual mentoring 
uh, can be as effective as in-person mentoring in terms of networking and career mentoring. And so I constructed a virtual mentoring system, which consisted of three primary components. Um, so the image shows an interaction of a user talking to the interface uh, of the system. So we had three user interfaces. Um, we used a graphical avatar. We had two mobile interfaces, one using a Twitter app and one for text messaging, that's Twilio. Um, and then we had a natural language understanding engine um, that would take in user input, understand what they're asking and provide the proper response, which um, is taken from the knowledge base that which was, which was created from interviewing experts, um, asking several questions and, and compiling the responses to create this knowledge base for them to use. And so we did a within subjects mixed methods um, usability study where 20 participants um, tried each user interface um, and we used a system usability scale to understand the old, their perceived usability of each interface. Um, so participants were graduate students, undergraduate students, postdocs, and even early career faculty. And so the findings from this study show that the mobile interfaces were more usable and accessible than a web base. Um, there was no difference between um, Twitter and text messaging. They both were very accessible from the perspective of the participants. Overall, they found the virtual mentor to be credible and believable, especially when they have a face or some type of appearance. Um, they perceived the virtual mentoring system as a good first option for novice learners and aspiring uh, computer scientists. They did have one recommendation that the BMS be uh, able to personalize the interaction with the users. And so coming to the close of my talk, um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about some of my areas of future research. And so some of my future work includes um, continuing my research in online learning. So expanding the problem space into a larger issue involving uh, leveraging community resources and technology to provide more access to online learning opportunities from users from low socioeconomic status and people with disabilities. Um, and then also exploring online learning being more personalized uh, for learners, especially those with disabilities. So how can we leverage uh, techniques in machine learning to make platforms provide the necessary services as well as interaction to make the online learning experience accessible and enjoyable? And lastly, I want to continue my work in diversifying the computing workforce um, by increasing participation of youth from underserved populations uh, in CS. So I'd like to partner with K-12 schools and community organizations to develop workshops and other programs um, to get them interested more so in uh, computer science and, and basically develop a sense of identity within computing and self-efficacy. And with that, I end my talk and now receive questions. Thank you all for listening and attending. Thank you so much, Earl. I um, really appreciate that incredibly diverse uh, talk. I feel like I got a whirlwind of a lot of really fantastic projects. So um, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions to folks. And then I'm also going to apologize to folks. Now I will have a hard stop at three. So I'm going to leave in about eight minutes, but Daniel's going to moderate uh, any questions and so on as the wonderful seminar host that he is. Um, so I've seen some folks chatting, great talk, but uh, questions that anyone has, go ahead and feel free to put them in the chat if you can't ask them or raise your hand um, if you can ask them verbally. There we go. Oh, and we can see one another now. Wonderful. <laughs> Questions for folks? I will start with one while people are uh, thinking or finding their mute button, such as the case may be, either way, um, which is I'm super interested. So, you know, I've read your work before, but I don't think I'd ever heard you talk about the mix storytelling and PD work together. And I just find that like a really interesting method. So I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit more on maybe what other contexts beyond blind users that you might use that in or any of the sort of challenges or opportunities you see in, in that method, because it's just not one that I've used before myself. Thank you. So definitely storytelling was an interesting approach. Um, and so I did a lot of investigation into like the importance of how storytelling helps with uh, participants 
really thinking about their own experiences, really think about some of the um, challenges they may have come with. And so it was definitely interesting as I was hearing their stories and what really came out of those stories. And so I found that they connected strongly with um, what I discussed with those stories. And, you know, when I talk about my dissertation and more, it's, you know, a lot came out and very poured out. And so I find that storytelling in a sense really um, helps to paint that picture, to really introduce the concept, especially if you're working with populations that may not um, be too familiar or adapt with technology in a sense. So it helps you to tell it in a way that they may be able to better understand and connect with. So even thinking back to the enactment study uh, with Thomas Vehicle, that was also a bit of a story as well in a sense, and developing these scenarios working with older adults um, who didn't have as much prior knowledge into autonomous vehicles. And so uh, in that sense, they were able to um, be involved in the study and really offer some significant uh, input in that matter. So to, to me, I figured uh, storytelling can work in different contexts for different participants because it, how you shape the story um, can help with your participants understanding the context of which they're being involved in, in the study. And so I would definitely utilize storytelling more often other methods as well. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, Novia, did you have a question? I did, um, thank you for the talk. Uh, it was very interesting. And I think as a first year PhD student, um, seeing how you incorporated so many different types of methods for so many different studies, uh, my, I'm curious, and it's kind of a follow-up to Jillian's question as well. How did you decide or find some of these creative ways to seek um, input from the users um, or the potential users? So we're learning like focus group and interviews in class, but I personally haven't um, seen any studies that use like role-playing um, or some of the other methods that you mentioned, even like storytelling. Yeah, so definitely one of the things I appreciate from the lab I work in is really looking, thinking outside the box, looking at different ways that we can really, you know, find information that we need. And so, um, particularly with the enactment study, um, we definitely look through the literature, find something similar. So in actuality, in a sense, my advisor had used a kind of a, a quasi-naturalistic um, method, a simulation for a dissertation. And with that, he kind of uh, leaned on the aspect of the role play. And so that's when we really deep dive and discovered, you know, an act, user enactment as um, one such way of looking into it. And so uh, we never used it, used enactment before, before using, using it for our study, um, took a lot of prep and using props involved, but it panned out to be a great experience, especially when you're trying to learn about how people are thinking about using autonomous vehicles when we don't even have one uh, for that matter like we try to get tesla but some walls came up so that was not a, that was not feasible <laughs> so uh, so we had to so we resorted to using acting which was fun the diary study that i used so uh fun facts the third exploratory study was supposed to be in-person observation so i was actually going to sit in a classroom uh, with a teacher and vision impaired students and actually kind of observe but pandemic, which has beaten my dissertation over the head uh, a number of times. So it's hanging on by the threads. Um, so thinking about, I um, actually had a class that talked about different field study methods and a diary study was one. Uh, we had used it before when we did research in social media for blind and visually impaired persons uh, in that regard. So it's really just really thinking about you know, looking outside, you know, some of the traditional methods that we use and finding uh, things just don't deep dive into literature. I can't specify enough, like how important that really is. So when your advisors, when your teachers tell you, you know, look in literature for stuff, like <laughs> actually believe it because you will be surprised what you find and even looking outside of your area too. So not just, you know, within ACI, look elsewhere too for encouragement. So my survey study, I looked into the the online education research. I didn't look in the ACM. That came from a, a journal and called online learning. That's where I, that's where I found the instrument really. So I hope that answers your question. I know it was a mouthful. No, that was really helpful. Thank you.
We're getting some more thank yous for the talk. Um, and I'm gonna now do what I said, which is I'm gonna call on Imani and then I'm gonna jet. So Earl, it was a pleasure <laughs> to see you. Thank you so much. I'll leave you in the capable hands of Daniel and the whole team. Thank you, thank you. And um, over to you, Imani, you. for your question. Hi, Earl. Um, first, awesome talk. Um, you had a lot of great nuggets in there. Um, I wanted to, to hit on your closing remarks where you were talking about your future work is going into um, seeing how we can implement STEM programs and participation in uh, marginalized communities. That, that's something that like I'm passionate with um, outside like just my, uh, my research. And I wanted to like from your perspective, what does that look like? How do you think is the best method of bringing STEM um, programs and resources into um, underserved communities, specifically, I would say the black community. Thank you. And one of the biggest issues is not even having the, the resources in particular. And so some of my early work, we were doing interactive workshops. So um, one such was the Atlanta Code Words, which was done in Atlanta. So we worked with Google, Georgia Tech, um, Morehouse, Spelman, uh, Clark Atlanta, all got together to actually um, do this um, four-week program with middle school students. So there were two uh, middle schools uh, that were interested in this program. And so it's really, if they don't have the courses, then um, integrate ways that they can actually get the experience and really get the work at it. Because when they can actually see themselves doing the work, when they can actually see the labels of their work, it then creates a sense of, I can do this. And that's really what it comes down to is, can we develop a sense of identity in STEM, in computing in particular, um, in the use? And particularly I focus on K-12 because it's in that stage where it's where they're thinking about, you know, what they want to do when, if they decide to go to college or, or, other, um, or other aspects or industry right away. And so if you target them like in middle school or high school, then you help to, I guess, influence their, their options, their choices and opportunities, which is part of the reason why you see such low representation in CS because not many schools have them. So I would say definitely invest in like interactive workshops in a sense. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that, that definitely did. I'm actually planning a summer program back home and I definitely didn't think about like doing workshops. So that's, I think that'll be perfect. Thank you. Yes, that's wonderful. All the best for that. Go ahead, Johanna. I, I just, hey, Earl, I just wanted to say hi <laughs> and appreciate this conversation. Um, just as a former special education director, just understanding the inclusivity that needs to be put into the classroom. Um, this is a great talk. So, and then, like you said, doing workshops, uh, I actually did a workshop at Morehouse um, where kids just appreciated the representation to see that this is something that they can do um, inside of the classroom. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, and that's wonderful to hear. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Uh, more raised hands. Uh, Cameron, go ahead. Yeah, how's it going? Uh, so one question, or one thing that uh, I took away from your work was like this big pivot that happened in your research interests. Could you kind of explain how that came about and how you kind of undertook that, that change? <clears throat> so, uh, the research I do in the Thomas Vehicle is a part of the research I do in the research lab that I work in. So we do work in accessibility. The primary domain is um, transportation, but it's another facet of technology for social good, in which my research kind of fall on that. Now, I've always, you know, computer science education has always been the heart of what I want to do, and that's what I've done, um, up until working in um, the drive lab, which I work in now, you know, I had worked largely with um, uh, particularly racial and ethnic groups. But when I pivoted to working in the lab and when I wanted to do more accessibility research, I wanted to think more about, you know, what are some intersections with accessibility and education? And through the research, I find that uh, accessibility and CS education, you know, there's not as much work as there should be. Um, especially for blind or visually impaired persons. And so um, it was really concerning to see there's a lack, like there's a number of accessibility researchers on this talk right now, on this talk right now. And they can even they can even tell that we're a small community. We're we're a small, small group in a larger scale. 
And then even certain works like accessibility and CS education is also small. And so I wanted to pivot and focus more on representation of people with disabilities in CS education more so. Yeah, great to uh, take your your interest and see where the the gap in the the literature is is really needed and and uh, doing work in that space. Uh, go ahead, Stacy. Hi, Earl. Hello. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I, I'm waiting. I waited to the end to ask a question because I have I'm spoiled. I get a lot of time with Earl because I get to work with him on the accessibility committee for the SIGCHI executive committee um and uh and such so but anyway i thought it would be fun to ask you a question that some of the students in my lab have been asking me lately um how do they synergize their research and service activities it's something i think you've done very well i'm aware of the papaya project and your involvement there and the access committee i was just wondering if you could um share some of your tips and tricks it comes down really to what you're passionate about. And really, when you're doing your research, it really should be what you're passionate about, essentially. And so in, in that sense, you know, when you combine what your passion is with research, you should definitely look for opportunities uh, in the community where you can kind of take that just beyond the research, beyond the academic realm. And so when I'm doing a research with accessibility and, you know, doing work with accessibility committee, you know, it, it you know, it was not difficult to decide on at all. Like, I was like, great, this is what I want to do. When working with the Papyrus Project and dealing with um, issues of identity and computing education, you know, it correlates to what I do when I research and I'm passionate about. So like, of course, let's do this, let's put this together. And so really it's, it's a matter of driving that passion and looking for these opportunities, even connecting with people in other spaces to even get this off the ground. And so I would encourage, those um, who are really infusing their passion in their research and is to really look at opportunities that uh, you can kind of serve the community in that sense, whether it's in academia, whether it's in like the ACM or other organizations, um, or even just locally, um, look for those opportunities. I hope that answers the question. Awesome sauce. Yes, thank you. All right, then, then we can end on that note. Thank you so much, Earl, for, for coming and joining us and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation in person, uh, hopefully in a, in a couple of months, COVID permitting. Yes, definitely would love to come out to uh, uh, Orange County and really see the campus and see the students. I'm really upset that we didn't have the opportunity, but hopefully it definitely come uh, to visit everyone. Looking forward to it. Thank you all.